Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is the research results presentation for the study determining the limitations of warm mix asphalt by water injection and mix design, quality control, and placement. It was performed under the direction of Dr. Ala Abbas at the University of Akron. Um, we're going to ask that everyone in the room please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. At that time, we will bring a microphone over to you so that those participating via the webinar can hear your question. For those of you who are watching on the Internet, if you have any questions, please email those to research at dot.state.oh.us, and we will forward those on for Dr. Abbas to reply to. Uh, within a few weeks following this presentation, a recording of the presentation, a PDF of the PowerPoint, and the final report will be available on the research website for downloading. Uh, please just check back to that within a couple of weeks. Otherwise, Dr. Abbas. Thank you, Vicki. And uh, again, thank you all for attending this presentation. The title of my presentation is Determining the Limitations of Four Mixed Asphalt. Uh, produced by water injection, mixed design, quality control, and placement. Again, my name is Ala Abbas. Uh, this project was uh, conducted in collaboration between the University of Akron and Ohio University. Uh, the research team from the University of Akron consisted of myself, uh, my graduate students, Ayman Ali and Ahmed Al Hassan. Uh, Ahmed Ayman recently received his PhD, and Ayman Ahmed recently received his master's degree. Uh, from Ohio University, we had Dr. Munir. Nazel and Dr. Shad Sargand, and the graduate student uh, who recently received his master's degree was uh, Mr. Uh, Arjun Roy. I would like to start my presentation by thanking uh, Mr. David Powers uh, from materials, uh, Office of Materials Management, uh, Mr. Craig Landfield, Mr. Eric uh, Beale, uh, Ms. Cynthia Gerst, uh, Ms. Uh, Vicky Fout, Ms. Jill Martindale, and Ms. Kelly and I from the research uh, section. Uh, the following is the outline for my presentation. I'll start with a quick background uh, regarding this project. I'll go over the study objectives. Uh, I'll cover the research methodology, material information, results and discussion, conclusions, uh, and then we'll go over for the recommendations for implementation, and then we'll end with uh, questions. Uh, for the background, traditional asphalt mixtures are typically produced at temperatures ranging between 300 and 325 degrees Fahrenheit, and these mixtures are commonly referred to as hot mix asphalt. So if you pull, take any uh, existing uh, asphalt mixture book, they will typically refer to this material as hot mix asphalt. In recent years, over the last five to ten years, there has been an increased interest in using a new type of asphalt mixtures called war mix asphalt. Uh, as the name of this material imply it's produced at a lower temperature than the traditional hot mix asphalt. Uh, several warm mix asphalt technologies are available. Some of them use additives, chemical or organic additives, while others inject the asphalt binder with water, resulting in foamed asphalt binder. Now, foamed asphalt binder produced by water injection has received increased interest and use in Ohio since it requires a one-time plant modification and does not require the use of costly additives. So it's less expensive to use that particular uh, technology. And over the last five years, the amount of foamed worm mix asphalt used in Ohio has increased to more than 50% of the total amount of asphalt mixtures used in the state. Key benefits that have been promoted for warm mix asphalt and foamed warm mix asphalt include reduced emission during production, so there is a green technology, it's promoted as a green technology, improved field compaction, so it's easier for the contractors to really achieve the required density with lower number of passes or the same number of passes, uh, improved working conditions, you're not going to get as much odor. Uh, and emissions, and the workers are going to be less uh, negatively affected with these orders, and the ability to use higher wrap contents. There are several states that are experimenting with adding or using more wrap, recycled asphalt pavement, uh, into the uh, worm mix asphalt. So uh, despite the previous advantages, there are several concerns regarding the long-term performance of foamed worm mix asphalt. These concerns were identified 
early on in the uh, process when we submitted the proposal, and we tried to develop a work plan to address these uh, concerns. So the main concerns with regarding to worm asphalt in general and formed worm asphalt in specific uh, include the increased rutting due to reduced binder aging because you are not heating the binder to the same high temperature like hot, hot mix asphalt, so you are not cooking it uh, enough, and it will be softer, so it might depress or compress easier and it will result in rutting. Increased, increased moisture induced damage due to insufficient aggregate drying. Sometimes if you lower your production temperature, you may not allow your aggregates to fully dry during production and that, would result, that could result in moisture induced damage. Insufficient aggregate coating, again, it's an issue that might arise if you don't fully dry your aggregates. Ability of hot mix asphalt uh, mix design, applicability of hot mix asphalt mix design to formed wear mix asphalt. Uh, the uh, hot mix asphalt, there is a typical process. There is a well-established process for how to perform the mix design for it. But wear mix asphalt, there are some changes in it. Uh, however, we still are using the same mix design process for hot mix asphalt to produce the warm mix asphalt. So is this, how applicable is this? How uh, useful is that? Is, again, is, is there a need to make any modifications? This is something that we needed to look in here. Therefore, research is needed to evaluate the performance of formed warm mix asphalt and determine the factors that affect its long-term durability. Uh, in addition, current mix design methods and specifications used by ORAT for formed worm mix asphalt shall be validated or revised to ensure satisfactory long-term uh, performance. Uh, so study objectives. One, evaluate the factors that affect the volumetric properties, performance, and durability of formed worm mix asphalt. Uh, determine the limitations of formed worm mix asphalt. Currently, worm mix asphalts in Ohio are produced at 30 degrees Fahrenheit lower temperatures than the uh, corresponding hot mix asphalt. And during the production, there is a uh, maximum foaming water content of 1.8%. So we wanted to look at these parameters uh, and determine whether uh, what would happen if we go to 50 degrees Fahrenheit lower or 70 degrees Fahrenheit lower. If we increase the foaming water content, what will happen to the performance? Identify changes to current mix design and evaluation procedures, if any, that will be required for foam door mix asphalt. Uh, evaluate current ODAT quality control and placement procedures to determine the applicability to formed worm mix asphalt. And here we're mainly interested in compaction, if there is a need to uh, basically change uh, the requirement for compaction. Identify changes to current ODAT specifications for formed worm mix asphalt to ensure satisfactory long-term performance. So uh, we try to basically develop a work plan that address a comprehensive evaluation of this product and try to look for what kind of changes are uh, needed. Uh, for this uh, research study, we had five main parts. Uh, the first part looked at the uh, performance of foamed wear mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt in the laboratory. We tried to run several tests co to compare the performance of uh, foamed wear mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt with regard to uh, certain uh, pavement distresses that are common uh, for asphalt mixtures. Uh, we looked at the workability and compactability of foamed worm mix asphalt versus hot mix asphalt. We looked at the uh, mix effect of the mix preparation procedure on foamed worm mix asphalt. Again, if we change the production temperature, foaming water content, aggregate moisture content, what will happen to the performance of this material? Performance evaluation of foamed worm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt in the accelerated pavement loading facility. Uh, we tried to look at the performance of field produced materials and uh, how they are going to compare to laboratory produced materials. Uh, and then performance evaluation of foamed worm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt using the mechanistic empirical pavement design guide. I'm going to focus on the four main parts because that's really what uh, the material side is interested in and I'm going to skip the uh, fifth part for the sake of time. So we're going to start with the laboratory performance of foamed worm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt. We used four material combinations in this study. Uh, for the first material combination, we used limestone that was produced using as a surface mixture using PG70-22. For the second one, we used limestone that was produced as a, an intermediate mixture uh, using PG70-22. The third one was limestone intermediate mixture 
PG64 minus 28, and the fourth one was crushed gravel surface mixture PG70 minus 22. All mixtures were produced as a super paved mix, uh, and the, this material combination allowed us to compare the effect of the aggregate. So in here, if you look at this material combination and this material combination, you will notice that the only difference between them is really the aggregate. This also allowed us to compare the effect of the asphalt binder. So if you look at this material combination and this material combination, you will notice that the main difference between them is the asphalt binder. And uh, we were able to compare the aggregate size. The surface is a 12.5 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size, and the intermediate is a 19 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size. And both of these two mixtures were produced using limestone and 70 minus 22. So now we can compare the effect of the aggregate size on the uh, performance. In here, we don't have a full factorial. If we want to do a full factorial, it would require we have two aggregate types, two aggregate sizes, and two binder types. So it would, a full factorial would be two times two times two, and that would be eight. However, if we want to perform the testing on all eight material combinations, this project would need to be four years instead of two years. So for the sake of time, and since this is basically what we're interested in, we limited it to four. That will imply that we have to statistically analyze the data in a little bit different way than if we have a full uh, factorial. But again, I wouldn't necessarily consider that as a, a limitation of the study. It's just targeted uh, with regarding to uh, the performance of particular materials. And these are the materials that are typically used in Ohio. I think the only material combination that is not used in Ohio is really the limestone intermediate and 70 minus 22. And we included this one to determine the effect of the binder type. So we can compare the PG64 minus 28 and the PG70 minus uh, 22 for that intermediate mixture. Now, uh, a traditional asphalt mixture is typically produced by heating the asphalt binder, heating the aggregate, and mixing them in a mixer. Now, with the foamed wormix asphalt, you need to foam the asphalt binder. And by foaming the asphalt binder, we need to introduce cool water uh, with uh, air to make the asphalt binder foam. So you're going to end up with air bubbles inside that asphalt binder, and it will increase in volume. And for this particular study, we used a, a laboratory foaming device that is produced by Ritgen, and it's called the W. LB10 laboratory scale asphalt binder foaming device. So in here you can see the asphalt binder tank, air tank, water tank, and this is where the foaming nozzle is. And you control the water content, uh, the temperature, all these other parameters, air pressure, uh, water pressure from the control panel. So it's a very sophisticated, again, uh, laboratory setup that would allow you to produce that foamed asphalt binder. This has typically been used for cold asphalt mixtures, uh, but in this study it was used for foamed wormix asphalt and uh, uh, several really uh, research centers and universities have bought this same device because of the identified advantages for it in producing foamed wormix asphalt that uh, is uh, expected to mimic the uh, foaming setups that we have in the uh, in the uh, plants. So for the laboratory testing plant uh, program, uh, we focused on four main distresses, rutting, durability or moisture-induced damage, fatigue cracking, and low temperature cracking. For rutting, we used the asphalt pavement analyzer test, dynamic modulus test, and the flow number test, and I'm going to explain these tests in a little bit more detail. For the moisture-induced damage, we used the modified Lotman or ASHTO T283 test. We used the condition E-STAR test, whereby we conditioned the asphalt mixture specimens according to the same procedure that is used in ASHTO T283, and we retested them for dynamic modulus. And for the wet EPA, we ran the APA test under water after conditioning the asphalt mixture specimens. So this way we can determine what is the effect of the conditioning and the water on the asphalt, uh, on the performance of the asphalt mixtures. For fatigue cracking, we used a test procedure called 
dissipated creep strain energy test, and I'm going to explain it in a little bit more detail. And for the low temperature cracking, we used the indirect inside strength test that is performed at low temperature less than zero degrees uh, centigrade. So for the asphalt pavement analyzer test, you can see the uh, setup that was used uh, for this test. And this is a picture that shows basically a close-up of what you will see inside uh, the chamber. So this chamber is capable of controlling the temperature, and this test was performed at 120 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, you have uh, rubber tubes in here that are uh, filled with air and is compressed to a hose pressure of 100 PSI. And then you have wheels that are uh, steel wheels that are concave down that will sit on the rubber and then will move back and forth to basically simulate uh, the moving tires from truck traffic on the pavement uh, structure and from there monitor how the depression or the rutting is going to accumulate. We looked at the rut depth after five passes, 500 passes, 1,000 passes, and 8,000 passes, and the rut depth was taken as the difference between the uh, reading, the dial indicator readings obtained at 8,000 cycles minus uh, five cycles. Uh, all mixtures had a dimensions of six inches by three inches and were compacted to an air void of seven plus or minus one uh, according to uh, OLAT and ASHTO specifications. Uh, the second test is the dynamic modulus uh, test. In this test, we prepare a cylindrical specimen, as shown in this uh, slide, and then we uh, apply a cyclic compressive load on this specimen. By looking at the stress amplitude versus the strain amplitude, the ratio between them is going to be called the dynamic modulus. Uh, the dynamic modulus is a measure of the stiffness of the material or the resistance of the material to deformation. In recent years, this test has received uh, increased uh, interest from the uh, asphalt research uh, group uh, in an effort to basically relate it to rutting and material performance. In addition to the dynamic modulus, we typically get the phase angle that tells us how elastic or how viscoelastic is the material. Uh, so if you get a phase angle of zero, that means that you are dealing with an elastic material. If you get a phase angle of 90, that means that you have a viscous material. And you have, if you have a phase angle between zero and 90, that means that you have a viscoelastic uh, material. Uh, this is a picture of the specimen preparation. So we prepare the specimens in a super gyratory compacted mold. We core it and then we trim it and we make sure that it's uh, prepared according to specifications. This test was performed at over a range of uh, frequencies and temperatures and that allowed us to capture the behavior of the material and the dependency of the material on the temperature and the loading rate. Okay. For the flow number, we used the same uh, specimens or the specimens prepared using the same way. The test was performed at 54.4 degrees centigrade, and uh, in this test we applied a Haversine pulse load uh, with a load pulse over a 0.1 second and the rest period over a 0.9 second, and you multiply or, and you apply a large number of cycles, and you look at the uh, point where you get into the tertiary uh, flow range to that which would indicate your failure. So we applied 10,000 cycles, and if you get anything within the 10,000 cycle, that would be basically your flow number. If you get anything over the 10,000 cycle, then you typically use the 10,000 to indicate that. And uh, we typically take the flow number as the point at which you have the minimum or the lowest rate of change of uh, micro strain, and that would indicate your flow number. So you typically would want your material to flow or reach that tertiary flow at a larger flow number value. That would indicate a better resistance to uh, rutting. For the uh, modified Lotman, uh, which is very commonly used, which is the most common procedure in Ohio that is used for moisture-induced damage, we use six-inch diameter specimens by 3.75-inch uh, that were prepared at uh, 7 plus or minus 0.5% uh, air voids. Uh, we loaded the specimens diametrally until the specimens uh, failed, and the testing was 77 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. We tested uh, two groups of specimens. One of them was uh, tested immediately after preparation, and the other group of specimens was first conditioned and subjected a, to a freeze and thaw cycle and then broken. Usually, once you 
uh, apply that freeze and load cycle to the specimen, there will be a reduction in strength, and the amount of reduction is typically uh, used to determine how uh, uh, resistant is that uh, material to uh, moisture-induced uh, damage. For the dissipated creep strain, uh, for the uh, fatigue cracking, we used the dissipated creep strain energy uh, test in which we loaded a specimen also diametrally until failure. Uh, instead of just using the strength value, we also use the deformation value. So now you would want your material to have a high strength, but you would want it also to have enough ductility in there to flow before it actually breaks. And that's basically the basis of the dissipated creep strain energy. So it's an indirect method to really assess the fatigue cracking of asphalt uh, mixtures. As opposed to this, uh, the more common procedure involves basically repeated bending of uh, asphalt beams all the way until failures. The, the main challenges with that is the specimen preparation, the time it takes to uh, break the specimen, and then the cost of the whole setup. We did not have that setup, so we went for an alternative procedure suggested by Roque et al., and that is based on breaking the specimen and looking at the strength and the tensile strain at failure, indirect tensile strain at failure, and using that uh, in determining the uh, susceptibility of asphalt mixtures to flow. So uh, in this schematic, I'm showing the dissipated creep strain energy and how it's calculated. You can take the whole area. You need to take the whole area first and then subtract from it the elastic energy to calculate the dissipated creep strain energy. If a mixture has a high tensile strength at failure and the high tensile, indirect tensile strain at failure, this means that it will have a high dissipated creep strain er energy, and that would mean that it will have good resistance to fatigue uh, cracking. Indirect tensile strength, this is the test that was conducted at uh, low temperature, so we uh, had to use a, more, uh, a temperature, a, an environmental chamber to reduce the temperature. We conducted it at minus 10 degrees centigrade, and in this test, we just broke the specimen diametrally, and we looked at the uh, tens uh, indirect tensile strength and indirect tensile strain at failure to uh, represent performance at uh, low temperature, and I'll comment on the results that we obtained uh, from uh, this test. Okay, so test results. I'll try to uh, go over uh, a summary of the test results. Uh, there has been lots of tests performed, so I'll try to uh, pick and choose from these test results. Otherwise, again, the time uh, would not be sufficient. Uh, so for wetting, when we performed the asphalt pavement analyzer test, we noticed that if you're just trying to compare hot mix asphalt with uh, foamed warm mix asphalt, in general, the results look uh, close to each other. Uh, you can see in here that basically there is not much difference, not much difference, not much difference, and not much difference. Sometimes, again, you will see that the hot mix asphalt is a little bit higher. Sometimes you will see that the uh, warm mix asphalt is a little bit higher. But in general, just by looking at, again, the average and the standard deviation, you can tell that the results are statistically in, uh, significant. And we performed the statistical analysis to verify these results. From these test results, you can see that the asphalt binder was uh, one of the most important factors that control the resistance uh, to rutting. And as expected, uh, you will have a higher rutting obtained for uh, PG64 minus 28 than PG70 minus uh, 22, simply because this is uh, designed to uh, withstand temperature up to 64, whereas this is a stiffer asphalt binder and is expected to uh, withstand temperatures up to 70. Uh, so uh, these results, again, uh, makes sense. So in here, by uh, looking at the ANOVA analysis for the uh, APA rut depth, rut, uh, depth, you can notice that we performed three type of comparisons. Again, the reason why we performed this, these three comparisons is because we don't have a full factorial. Uh, if we had a full factorial of eight uh, combinations, we can just do one analysis and we can get all the results and we can look at all the results together. But since we only have four material combinations now, you have to really compare combinations that have uh, targeted differences. So if uh, you have, for example, limestone and PG70 minus 22, if you're trying to look at the effect of the aggregate size, you have to look for the limestone, PG70 minus 22, and then just vary the surface versus intermediate mixtures to determine the effect of that aggregate size. And if you're interested in the binder size, uh, binder grade, you have to keep these other ones to be the same. And in here you can see that 
uh, for uh, this, these comparisons, the uh, binder type was the most really significant effect on the rutting performance, which is expected. Again, because we have a 19 millimeter normal maximum aggregate size and we have a PG70 minus 22 versus PG64 minus 28. But by comparing the uh, mix effect, you can see that in all comparisons, the effect of uh, the mix type was greater than 0.05. That means that it's insignificant. So the F value, the higher is the F value, the greater is the significance, and the lower is the probability, the greater is the significance. Uh, this shows the dynamic, mo this uh, slide shows the dynamic modulus test results that we obtained that demonstrate the effect of the binder type. Again, uh, you can notice that uh, the Wormix asphalts had lower uh, stiffnesses than the uh, hot mix asphalts, and uh, that the uh, PG64 minus 28 uh, had lower stiffnesses than the PG70 minus uh, 22, again, which is uh, relatively expected. For the flow number, we noticed that there was some uh, effect for the uh, using the formed Wormix asphalt, and in some cases we had the Wormix asphalt give us, uh, giving us a little bit lower flow number values. A lower flow number value means, again, uh, or a higher flow number value means that you have a better performance. So if you look at this material com uh, combination and you compare this versus that, you will see that this hot mix asphalt has a little bit better performance than the formed wear mix asphalt. Now, what's the difference between the flow number test and the uh, APA test that is making these results look uh, different than what we got in the APA test. These should give you the same answers if all tests are conducted under the same conditions. One of the main differences between these test procedures is that we conducted the flow number test with no confinement, okay? Whereas the flow number has a confinement. And in here we're dealing with aggregates in some cases that have a normal maximum aggregate size of 19. So when, as we know from soil mechanics, any effect of any confinement that you apply in here is going to result in higher stiffness and better resistance to uh, rutting. So applying, the, uh, performing this test with no confinement is going to have some effect on the uh, test uh, results. And you would expect, again, that once you go to the 19 millimeter and PG64 minus 28, since we don't have confinement, that you're going to basically get uh, the uh, lowest values. But again, uh, that would... Uh, again, by comparing the uh, performance of the warm mix asphalt and the hot mix asphalt, uh, we notice that there is a slight uh, difference be between the mixtures in here, but uh, in general, uh, the results uh, look uh, relatively uh, close. And in here, again, you can see that once we look at the effect of the mix type, it's really borderline uh, significant uh, with regarding to uh, writing for the flow number uh, test, whereas the effect of the binder type aggregate type and the aggregate size was uh, more significant on these uh, test uh, results. So for the moisture-induced damage, again, in here we're showing the uh, dry and wet indirect inside strength ratio or the unconditioned and conditioned uh, indirect strength uh, ratio, ratios obtained uh, from the ASH to T283 test. And in here, if you want to look at the effect of using the Formed warm mix asphalt versus hot mix asphalt, you're going to compare the first one with the third one. And for the condition, you're going to compare the second one with the fourth uh, one. And you can see in this comparison that really for the uh, formed warm mix asphalt versus hot mix asphalt, we do not really see much uh, difference. Uh, even if you look at this graph and you can see, well, the average standard deviation, there are still st some values, but if you look at the individual values, really, st like experimentally, there is not much difference between 120 and 130 if you're going to that particular range. Usually, if there is 100 and 200, yes, there is a big difference, but if I get two specimens that are giving me 120 and 130, then uh, from an experimental point of view, uh, that is not much uh, of a uh, difference. For the tensile strength uh, ratio, this uh, slide shows the tensile strength ratio. Based on this project and previous projects that we have performed, really we felt that it's more appropriate to look at the indirect tensile strength rather than the tensile strength uh, ratio itself uh, in comparing the formed warm mix asphalt versus the hot mix asphalt because now you can look at the effect on the dry strength and the wet strength or unconditioned and conditioned uh, strength. In general, we found that basically there is not much uh, impact on the uh, indirect tensile strength ratio by using the formed warm mix asphalt. Now, 
these test results have to be verified by, by what the asphalt section, for example, obtains from uh, field-produced asphalt mixtures because uh, there has been some uh, research that suggested that uh, there are some uh, differences when it comes to the moisture-induced damage obtained using laboratory-prepared and field-prepared asphalt uh, mixtures. In the lab, we did not really find that there is a big difference between the hot mix asphalt and the war formed war mix asphalt. Uh, for the laboratory produced asphalt mixtures. And in here you can see the uh, uh, statistical analysis. Again, the mix type was more than 0.05, so uh, it was not significant. The testing, uh, the, con the conditioning procedure was more important, and again, the binder type uh, was more important on the uh, ASHTO T283 uh, test uh, results. And again, that's obvious from what we can see in here from this uh, particular uh, slide. Okay, for the conditioned uh, dynamic uh, modulus uh, testing, so we subjected the dynamic modulus specimens to conditioning and then we retested them uh, using the dynamic modulus test. And one interesting thing that we noticed by looking at the test results is that uh, the formed warm mix asphalt mixtures were less affected by conditioning than the hot mix asphalt mixtures. And we believe that one of the reasons why we have that is due to a, a lower asphalt binder absorption in formed wear mix asphalt that results in a thicker asphalt binder film thickness. So you're not getting enough moisture to really penetrate uh, the uh, asphalt binder film thickness and getting all the way to the aggregates. And that's why we're getting a little bit mo more closer uh, dynamic modular stiffness results for the unconditioned and conditioned warm mix asphalt, but when we did it with the hot mix asphalt, there was a little bit of uh, a difference. For the uh, wet APA or the wet asphalt pavement analyzer, in here we're using the same test setup that we use for the dry APA or dry asphalt pavement analyzer. However, when we try to first run the asphalt mixtures under water, without conditioning the asphalt mixtures, we got exactly the same results as we got for the dry APA. So that means that really the using the water in that device is not going to cause enough damage to the mixtures to see a big difference in rutting. Uh, this is different than the Hamburg wheel tracking device that some states use it to differentiate between mixtures based on moisture-induced damage. So in here, we try to say, okay, so what kind of thing can we do to the asphalt mixture to cause it uh, to differentiate between uh, dry and wet. So we said, why don't we apply the same conditioning that we used in ash to t 283 and then run the test underwater and try to see if there is going to be a big difference in uh, differentiation based on uh, conditioning. And we noticed that even when we did that, there was some effect on, you can see in here, this is, uh, hot mix asphalt, formed warm mix asphalt, these are the two conditions. So you can see there was a slight increase in the rutting, but that slight increase was still not high enough to really differentiate between mixtures. So this could either mean that the conditioning procedure is appropriate and can be used to simulate the test results and uh, simply we're not seeing difference, big difference between conditioned and unconditioned, or it can uh, simply imply that maybe a test procedure like the Hamburg grid tracking device will be more e aggressive, resulting in more better differentiation between the asphalt mixtures. Now, uh, going back to the test results that we can see in this slide, we can see that, again, uh, there is not much difference between the dry test results, which I presented in a previous slide, but also when we got looked at the wet, there was also no big difference between uh, the uh, wet. In fact, the wet for the uh, the average wet for the formed warm mix asphalt was even less than the average wet for the hot mix asphalt, if you look at all these values. And again, that ties into the same issue that we were discussing before. Maybe that you, since we have less absorption, that is resulting in a thicker asphalt binder film, and it's providing better protection uh, for the asphalt mixtures from conditioning and uh, from water. And in this slide, again, I'm showing the uh, test results for the uh, a dry and wet APA, so you can see that the mix type, there is no significant difference based on the uh, mix uh, type. Uh, fatigue cracking, this uh, slide shows the effect of the 
uh, fatigue tracking. Uh, you can see that again we got relatively similar results for all uh, limestone mixtures. The biggest difference was really for the uh, gravel mixtures. Now, uh, this particular gravel mixture was produced using crushed gravel that was obtained from the eastern region in Ohio that is known to have good crushed gravel uh, aggregate. Uh, and the limestone was obtained from uh, the Columbus uh, area. Uh, uh, so the crushed gravel that we have used in this uh, study, we felt that it actually had good uh, properties. And in general, we received good results uh, for that uh, crushed gravel. However, we noticed in some cases that when you used foamed worm mix asphalt versus hot mix asphalt for that crushed gravel, you might see a little bit more of a difference. So really, the use of the foamed worm mix asphalt is dependent on the binder type and the aggregate type. Some binders form better than others. In general, binders that are softer form better than binders that are stiffer. And uh, with regard to the uh, aggregate, again, you have to deal with what is the absorption of the aggregate, uh, what are the characteristics of the aggregates, and that would uh, make some influence. However, for the fatigue cracking, as suggested by Roque et al., any mixture that has a DCSE value greater than 0.75 kilojoule per meter cube is expected to perform satisfactorily with regard to uh, fatigue cracking, so we're not, we don't really see any issues with regard to fatigue cracking for both uh, mixtures. Okay, so this is again probably just a uh, uh, it has to do really with the overall mixed design process, that uh, the mixed design process that is currently used in all that seems to produce good uh, mixtures that are resistant uh, to uh, fatigue. Uh, and in here for the uh, results, you can see that all of them are more than 0.05, so there is not much uh, difference, and that the binder type had a little bit more of an effect on the uh, fatigue cracking. For the uh, low temperature cracking in here, I'm showing the indirect tensile uh, strength. And uh, you can see again that there is not much difference between the hot mix asphalt and the warm mix asphalt. However, the warm mix asphalt was in general a little bit had a lower strength than the hot mix asphalt. And that the PG64-28 had the lowest strength, which is expected because now we have to deal with the other side of the PG grade, which is the minus 28. Uh, when you are dealing with PG 70 minus 22 this mean, versus 64 minus 28, this means that the PG 70 is going to give you better resistance to rotting than PG 64. Now, when we look at the other side of the PG grade, in here we have PG minus 22 versus PG minus 28. This means that the minus 28 can resist temperatures down to minus 28 versus the minus 22 can resist temperatures down to minus 22. So you would expect that the minus 22 is going to be, the minus 28 is going to be better uh, with regard to uh, um, low temperature uh, cracking. In addition to this slide, there is another slide that I'm not showing in here where we looked at the tensile strain at failure. And we noticed that once you go to the minus 28, you get a much higher tensile strain at failure and as a result of that, uh, you will get a better resistance to low temperature cracking. Uh, as a follow-up to this study that I'm presenting in here, we did some additional testing uh, because we were interested in the low temperature performance of asphalt mixture that I'm not showing in this presentation, where we did some TSRST testing to compare the hot mix asphalt versus the uh, formed worm mix asphalt uh, performance. And uh, we uh, noticed several observations with regard to the performance of these materials that we feel are a little bit uh, more comprehensive than using the indirect tensile strength. In this study, we focused on rutting and moisture-induced damage, and we th felt that there is a need to do more work on low temperature, so we did more uh, testing on that. Uh, but uh, in here you can see again that there is an effect of the mixed type, there is an effect for the binder type, there is an effect for the aggregate type, and there is an effect for the aggregate size uh, on these uh, mixtures. Uh, so for the conclusions uh, for this part of the study, Formed worm mix asphalt mixtures exhibited slightly higher rut depth values in the unconditioned and conditioned APA tests, slightly lower dynamic moduli and slightly lower flow number values than the traditional HMA mixtures. However, the difference was found to be statistically insignificant. Therefore, the rutting potential of formed worm mix asphalt is expected to be comparable to that 
of hot mix uh, asphalt. Again, we're just comparing hot mix versus warm mix, uh, not the uh, individual material properties. Uh, foamed warm mix asphalt mixtures exhibited slightly lower unconditioned and conditioned indirect tensile strength values and comparable tensile strength ratios to the HMA mixtures in the ASHTO T283 test, in addition, formed warm mix asphalt mixtures exhibited slightly higher unconditioned and conditioned rut depth values in the APA test. However, the effect of the mix type was found to be statistically insignificant on the unconditioned and conditioned indirect and cell strength value as well as the unconditioned and conditioned APA rut uh, depth. So for the moisture-induced damage, again, uh, we don't uh, feel that the effect was very significant. Uh, on, of, from using the foamed wormix asphalt. So by comparing the unconditioned and conditioned APA rod depth, it was observed that the effect of sample conditioning uh, was more pronounced on the hot mix asphalt mixtures than the foamed wormix asphalt mixtures. This trend was also observed in the unconditioned and conditioned dynamic modulus tests for some of the mixtures. So in here we're saying that actually foamed wormix asphalt had a positive effect. Uh, because you had a little bit thicker asphalt binder film thickness and it provided a little bit uh, better uh, production uh, in some cases. For the fatigue cracking, the foamed warm mix asphalt mixtures exhibited slightly lower dissipated creep strain energy values than the hot mix asphalt. However, the difference was found to be statistically insignificant. In the addition, the dissipated creep strain values for all foamed warm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt mixtures were greater than 0.75 kilojoule per meter cube, which has been suggested by Roque et al. as a minimum DC SE uh, threshold value to ensure satisfactory resistance to fatigue cracking. This indicates that both foamed warm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt mixtures are expected to have adequate resistance uh, to uh, fatigue cracking. So for writing moisture-induced damage and fatigue cracking, we feel that really there is a comparable uh, performance. The Form warm mix asphalt are a little bit higher. Uh, there is a higher, slightly higher tendency for rutting. Uh, the uh, moisture-induced damage, uh, slightly uh, lower uh, strengths, uh, and for the fatigue cracking, again, slightly lower dissipated creep strain energy values. But in general, uh, still the performance is relatively uh, acceptable. Now, uh, formed warm mix asphalt mixtures exhibited slightly lower indirect inside strength values at 15, 14 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus 10 degrees centigrade, and comparable or slightly higher failure strain values than the corresponding HMA mixtures. The effect of the mix type was found to be statistically significant on the low temperature ITS values, but not on the failure strain values. Since the HMA mixtures had higher ITS values and similar failure strain values to the formed warm mix asphalt mixtures, the HMA mixtures are expected to have better resistance to thermal uh, cracking. This is a little bit contradictory to what we were expecting. Uh, we were expecting that when you use the foamed warm mix asphalt, you're not cooking the asphalt binder enough, you're not aging the asphalt binder enough, and that would result in better low temperature performance. So once we got these results again, we felt that there is a need to expand on what we did in this project and try to do some additional testing. So we went and looked into another device that we have at the University of Akron, which is the TSRST, and we used that device to basically compare the performance of these material uh, combinations. And uh, we noticed that, again, the foamed warm mix asphalt had a warmer fracture temperature than the hot mix asphalt uh, after short-term aging and comparable fracture temperatures uh, to hot mix asphalt after long-term aging. Uh, but again, the most important factor was the binder type, and PG64-28 performed uh, better than PG70-22 for low temperature uh, cracking. The TSRST, is, again, is a better test setup than uh, the indirect inside strength. Usually, if you want to do the indirect inside strength, you have to do it at multiple temperatures, and you have to uh, supplement it with some uh, theoretical analysis to uh, get really the uh, proper performance of asphalt mixtures. Uh, workability and compactability of foamed warm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt. Uh, we, uh, uh, one of the uh, advantages that are promoted for warm, foamed warm mix asphalt uh, is that they are more workable and more compactable. Again, that's why we, it's easier uh, to compact. So we try to look at how can we evaluate the workability and compactability of asphalt mixtures. And uh, for the workability, we did the literature search and we have identified some recently built devices that can simulate the workability of asphalt mixtures. And I'm going to show in the following slides some device that was 
uh, developed really at the University of Akron uh, from the design to the fabrication stage to uh, measure the workability of asphalt mixtures. And then we used some uh, data obtained from the superfluid geometry compactor to compare the compactability of the foamed warm mix asphalt versus the hot mix asphalt. So first, the workability device. Uh, as you can see in this device, we have a uh, bucket that is attached to a motor. Uh, this bucket will rotate, and inside this bucket we will have the asphalt mixture. Inside the asphalt, inside this bucket, we will have a mixing paddle that is attached to a blade, and this mixing paddle is attached to a torque sensor in here. And also, for this device, we have a temperature sensor in here that will look at the temperature of the asphalt mixture. So now, by rotating that bucket, we'll get a torque reading, and as the mixture it gets rotated, the temperature will drop and the torque value will increase. So that will give us an indication about the workability of the asphalt mixture. This slide in here shows the blade, and there are, we did lots of uh, research to determine the proper design for this blade. And uh, you can see in here in the back the temperature sensor, uh, the infrared temperature sensor that determines the temperature of the asphalt mixture. We included several safety features in this device, such as a steel cage, emergency stop button, uh, to make sure that nobody gets harmed in the uh, process. And again, this is the control electric box that provides the control that we can control the speed at which the bucket is rotating uh, and so on and so forth. So test results. Uh, in here I'm showing the uh, torque versus temperature readings that we obtained for the uh, surface mixtures that were prepared using limestone and PG70-22. And you can notice that, again, there is a higher torque value for the hot mix asphalt than the warm mix asphalt. And that was really consistently the same for all asphalt mixtures that we have uh, tested. In here I'm showing the models that we obtained for all uh, eight asphalt mixtures. And in here I'm showing the uh, comparison between the values obtained at 150 degrees centigrade and 100 in the following slide. So you can see that uh, the foamed wormix asphalt in general is easier and uh, more workable than, is easier to mix and more workable than the um, uh, corresponding hot mix asphalt. And you can see in here this is at 100 degrees uh, centigrade. So you can also see that the, uh, ink, uh, the uh, drop uh, in uh, uh, the increase in torque uh, is a little bit higher <clears throat> for the uh, hot mix uh, asphalt. For the compactability, again, we compared, in preparing the laboratory specimens, we uh, uh, had to reach a target air void level. So you tell the device how many number of gyrations you need to apply to get to that target air void level. And what we noticed in this study is that the results were a little bit comparable. Uh, in, some, in general, they were a little bit lower for the warm mix asphalt, but in some cases, they were really comparable. Uh, these results are a little bit different than what we obtained in a previous study when we were trying to look at the effect of the uh, formed warm mix asphalt. However, in the previous study, we were using a more asphalt binder, and in there, it was clearly that the uh, super number of gyrations that we applied was uh, less for the warm mix asphalt than the hot mix asphalt. So it's really dependent on the aggregate type that you're dealing with, aggregate size that you're dealing with, because in the previous study we were dealing with medium traffic instead of high traffic, so we're dealing with smaller aggregates, and the binder content. We're dealing with softer binder and the higher binder content. So uh, for these particular mixtures, again, we notice that the difference in compactability is not that big. However, if you reduce your aggregate size, use a softer asphalt binder, it will be easier to form, so the effect of the foam warm mix asphalt will be more. Use more asphalt binder, the, the differences in compactability would become even uh, more clear. Uh, so in general, again, uh, foam warm mix asphalt are expected to give comparable or uh, easier to compact uh, asphalt performance. So for the conclusion, the formed warm mix asphalt mixtures exhibited better workability than the traditional HMA mixtures. This was attributed to the lower asphalt binder absorption observed for the formed warm mix asphalt, another factor that might have contributed to the improvement in workability for formed warm mix asphalt mixtures is the presence of uh, vapor pockets entrapped within the uh, formed warm mix asphalt binder that serve to keep the binder slightly expanded and reduce its uh, viscosity. 
uh, for the compactability by comparing the compaction data obtained using the super paved gyratory compactor. During the preparation of the laboratory specimen, it was observed that the number of gyrations needed to achieve the target air void barrier for the foamed wormix asphalt was relatively close to that of the HMA specimens. This indicates that the compactability of the uh, foamed wormix asphalt is comparable to that of the corresponding HMA hot mix asphalt. But again, that's really related to the uh, material combinations that we used in this study. If you use smaller aggregates, uh, softer asphalt binder, higher asphalt binder content, you will get uh, higher, com uh, easier compactability for the warm mix asphalt as we obtained in a uh, previous uh, uh, student study. Uh, limitations of formed warm mix asphalt. Uh, currently, ORAT produces warm mix asphalt at 30 degrees Fahrenheit lower than hot mix asphalt. Uh, this, uh, this uh, specification uh, is really targeted to the compaction temperature not the production temperature, but in this study we did it for both the production and the compaction temperature. Uh, currently in the specification, uh, the maximum foaming water content is 1.8. In this study we said what would happen if we increase it to 2.2 or increase it to 2.6. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> aggregate moisture content, in general, you would expect that contractors will fully dry the aggregates until you get a 0% uh, water content, and then they would mix it uh, with the asphalt binder uh, in the drum or in the batch plant. However, if we use warm mix asphalt, again, we're going to slightly reduce, the, we may slightly reduce the production temperature, and sometimes the aggregate may not be thoroughly dry. So we said, what would happen if we keep the aggregate a little bit moist, not dry it fully, what would happen to the uh, performance? Uh, for this part of the study, we only use the APA test, indirect tensile strength test, and the TSR, which is again obtained from ASH to T283. So we have APA rod depth, dry indirect tensile strength, wet indirect tensile strength, and the tensile strength uh, ratio. And we compare the performance to the hot mix asphalt just to see uh, where we stand. So for the effect of the uh, temperature reduction on rotting first, we noticed that by increasing by uh, increasing the reduction temperature, so by producing the warm mix asphalt as 70 degrees Fahrenheit versus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, that we in general tend to get higher rutting. Okay, and also by increasing the temperature reduction or producing it at 70 versus 30, we get lower indirect tensile strength, both both dry and wet. So by producing or allowing contractors to produce the asphalt, the foamed wormix asphalt at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 70 degrees Fahrenheit lower than the 30 degrees Fahrenheit, this means that you're going to get uh, more wetting and uh, possibly moisture, uh, more moisture-induced uh, damage. Uh, now, this is for the effect of the uh, te temperature reduction. So as you will see in the recommendation, we recommend that we continue to produce the formed warm mix asphalt at 30 degrees Fahrenheit, lower than the hot mix asphalt. Now, what would happen if you produce this material at 50 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit? Again, one of the things that will be significantly affected is the absorption. You're going to have even less asphalt binder absorption, and that might lead to basically uh, this uh, issue. And here we have the statistical analysis, again, to support the uh, results, but for the sake of time, I'll try to go over it quickly. For the foaming water content, what we noticed is that if we increase the foaming water content, it actually will result in reduced rutting and relatively the same indirect inside strength. So the indirect inside strength, the dry and wet, was not really affected, uh, and the rutting performance actually improved uh, once we increased the foaming water content. What does that mean? That means that if ODAT decides to increase the foaming water content up to 2.6, we don't expect to see major issues in production. However, again, this is from a laboratory scale study. In actual production, there could be other issues that you have to deal with in terms of bag house, and whether there's going to be any kind of more water trapped in the bag house that would result in clumps uh, for the dust or some other issues that might have to deal with production that we did not really have to deal with uh, from the uh, laboratory standpoint. But again, 1.8 is relatively conservative. It can be slightly increased. I know that some states use 2% and they don't have any issues and possibly even higher, uh, and we don't think uh, it's going to be really... Uh, have a significant effect. Now, for the 
uh, aggregate moisture content, once we started uh, increasing the water content inside the aggregate, okay, or not allowing the aggregate to thoroughly uh, dry, we started ob to observe some coating issues. So it's very cr important that the aggregate gets fully dry. This is something that we learned from hot mix asphalt, but it got reiterated in here for formed warm mix asphalt. It's very important that aggregates fully dry in the, uh, pro during the production of formed warm mix asphalt uh, prior to mixing with the asphalt binder to get the desired performance. Uh, if uh, the production temperature is going to be lowered, that might mean that you will need to dry the aggregate for a longer period of time before you mix it with the asphalt binder in the drum, for example, uh, to make sure that you're going to get the desired performance. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, some uh, coating issues and that might affect its uh, long-term performance. One thing that we noticed, actually, uh, when we prepared the, uh, the asphalt mixtures that contained uh, moist aggregates, is that your GMM value actually will be higher because, again, you don't have full coating, so now you have water absorption into the aggregates, uh, and that will increase your GMM value. Okay, effect of temperature reduction, reducing the production temperature of foamed worm mix asphalt resulted in increased susceptibility to permanent deformation or rutting and moisture-induced damage. Therefore, it's recommended that the maximum reduction temperature of 30 degrees Fahrenheit be specified for the production of foamed worm mix asphalt or continue to be specified. Increasing the foaming uh, water content up to 2.6 of the weight of the asphalt binder during production of uh, foamed worm mix asphalt did not seem to have a negative effect on the riding performance or moisture sensitivity of foamed worm mix asphalt. Therefore, a higher foaming water content can be specified for the production of foamed worm mix asphalt in Ohio. Uh, producing foamed worm mix asphalt using moist aggregates resulted in an inadequate aggregate coating, leading to concerns with regard to moisture-induced damage and long-term durability. Therefore, it's critical to use fully dried aggregates in the production of foamed worm mix asphalt to ensure satisfactory mixed performance, giving that uh, foamed worm mix asphalt is typically produced using lower production temperatures than conventional hot mix asphalt. The aggregates may need to be dried for a longer period uh, of time. Uh, performance of foamed worm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt in the accelerated pavement facility at Ohio University. Uh, testing again was conducted at the accelerated pavement loading facility at Ohio University in Lancaster, uh, Ohio. Uh, we used four of the eight material uh, combinations that we have used in the uh, laboratory testing plan, and the asphalt mixture was produced by the uh, Shelley Company. Uh, this is a layout of the uh, lanes that we have in the uh, accelerated pavement loading facility. The reason why we selected these uh, four lanes is because they had the same uh, original uh, pavement structure uh, whereby we uh, milled the top three inches and we paved them with three inches of the selected material uh, combinations. In here we had hot mix asphalt versus warm mix asphalt produced as a, an intermediate mix. And in here we have hot mix asphalt versus warm mix asphalt produced as a surface mix. The intermediate mix was paved in one layer of three inches, whereas the surface mixtures were produced or were paved in two uh, lifts of one and a half inch each. Uh, each lane measured eight, inch in width, eight feet in width and 22.5 feet in uh, length. And this was the loading uh, direction. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit more detail. So this picture shows the facility from the outside. You can see that you can see the milling equipment uh, in here. Uh, the uh, research team, the Ohio University and the University of Akron research team was present in the, uh, at the plant during production and we obtained asphalt samples. You can see all these buckets. Uh, we obtained some asphalt samples uh, during production and we checked the uh, temperature of the asphalt mixtures uh, during productions. Uh, this is basically the milling process, and you can see the cold milling for the edges. This is the uh, end uh, result. In here you can see the tack coat that was applied. Uh, you would apply a tack coat on the existing surface so that it would bond, the new surface would uh, properly adhere to it. And here you can see the compaction and the uh, nuclear gauge that was used to determine the uh, density of the asphalt mixtures. You can see in here the two lifts for the surface mixture, and again, the intermediate mixtures were compacted in one lift. 
this is a picture of the uh, surface mixture, uh, the, uh, the uh, final surface, and this is the intermediate mixture. And again, you can see that it's larger aggregates for the intermediate mixtures. Uh, at, at the end of construction, we obtained six cores from each uh, lane so that we can take them and test them uh, in the lab. You can see the locations of these uh, cores. Uh, the pavement lane will be loaded in here away from the cores that were also filled after uh, coring. So these are the pictures of the cores. You can see there are 18 of them. Uh, at this point, that means that we have six uh, times three. There is still four, uh, more, uh, six more to get. The testing condition uh, for the uh, lane, uh, the testing temperature was 104 degrees Fahrenheit. We used a load level of 9,000 pounds, which is half the standard uh, axle load of 18,000 pounds. Uh, the wheel speed is five miles per hour. Uh, again, inside a, an accelerated pavement loading facility, you cannot go for the highway speeds. Uh, you're limited to the lower uh, speeds. We applied 10,000 cycles, and we took uh, profile measurements using a laser profiler uh, at multiple uh, number of cycles. And we did that at two locations uh, per uh, section. This is a picture of the wheel. We used a dual uh, wheel uh, setup that, again, had a 9,000-pound uh, weight on it, and this is a picture at the end of loading for one of the uh, lanes. And you can see that the, the wheel has moved to the other uh, lane in here. This is, again, uh, a slide that shows the initial profile and the profile obtained at uh, 300, 1,000, 3,000, <coughs> and 10,000 uh, cycles. Usually for rutting, we look at the initial profile minus the uh, end profile, which is the 10,000 in this particular case. Uh, this is the typical way to measure rutting for accelerated loading facilities. For rutting obtained in the field, we typically took, you put more like a straight edge in here and you measure rutting from here to there. Okay, but uh, again, for asphalt mixture, since it focuses on the material, uh, really we should look at the compressibility of the material, which is the initial in here minus the final uh, in here. So that's really what we uh, looked at. Now, uh, we have done some tests in the laboratory using laboratory produced materials. Uh, we obtained some asphalt mixture from the plant so we can test it again, the compact it in the laboratory and test it again. We have obtained some cores from the field so we can compact, uh, take these cores and test them in the lab. And we have the accelerated pavement loading uh, facility uh, test results obtained from the profiler so we can compare these. Now by comparing these two, we can look at the uh, quality of the material that was produced in the plant and as it compares to, the, to that produced in the laboratory. So what you can see in here is that these two had similar rut depths uh, as measured in the uh, APA. So that means that, again, uh, the material that we're producing in the lab is comparable to that produced in the uh, field. However, we noticed that for the field cores and for the asphalt pavement, uh, load sections, we got a little bit higher uh, rutting depth, especially for the field cores. Uh, we got, again, a little bit higher uh, values. Uh, this could be uh, due to, because we obtained the cores very quickly after construction, uh, we believe that, again, when we took the cores, the asphalt mixture may not have cooled enough because we used these ice uh, to basically obtain these cores. And then, in addition, it could be also to a, uh, due to a slightly higher air void uh, values in these cores because usually you look at the, like when we monitor the density you look at the average air void but you might have some cores that are in a uh, lower, lower uh, air void uh, region than the uh, others but uh, in general again we found that uh, for uh, uh, both uh, hot mix asphalt and foamed warm mix asphalt uh, the results were actually uh, comparable if you again look at the individual uh, testing. Now, uh, we did some statistical analysis where we looked at the laboratory produced, laboratory compacted, plant produced, laboratory compacted, and plant produced field compacted field cores. And again, you can see the ranking in here. In the statistical analysis, you cannot include the uh, accelerated pavement loading facility because you're doing it under different conditions, like 10,000 cycles versus 8,000 cycles. So there, there is going to be, uh, you cannot really do it statistically. But in here, again, we found these two to be very comparable. So the plant produced and the laboratory produced were giving us very comparable. The field uh, produced uh, materials, uh, they had higher rut depth, and this is why you can see that the ranking was uh, B instead of uh, 
uh, A, the accelerated pavement loading facility and APA raw depth values obtained for the foamed worm asphalt and HMA mixtures were comparable for both surface and intermediate uh, mixtures. This suggests that the foamed worm asphalt mixtures had similar running resistance to the hot mix asphalt. So really we're getting that we're mainly interested in hot mix asphalt versus warm mix asphalt in here, and we get that the, there is not that much uh, difference uh, in the accelerated loading facility. The plant produced laboratory compacted and laboratory produced laboratory compacted specimens had comparable APA rod depth values for both foamed worm mix asphalt and HMA mixtures. This indicates that the laboratory mix preparation procedure used in this study resulted in comparable foamed worm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt mixtures to those produced in the uh, field in terms of materials. Okay, uh, recommended for implementations. Uh, now going to the specifications and how this might uh, impact specifications. Reducing the production temperature of foamed worm mix asphalt uh, led to increased susceptibility to uh, permanent deformation uh, and moisture induced damage. Therefore, it is recommended to continue to use a uh, reduction temperature of 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this reduction temperature seemed to have uh, given us good results in the lab and uh, uh, until this point, if there is uh, no field issues, uh, we feel that, again, it, it seems like it's a good temperature to you continue to use in the uh, specification. This is probably why we're not seeing a big difference in hot mix asphalt versus warm, uh, warm mix asphalt. Some states that might have noticed a little bit bigger difference between hot mix asphalt and warm mix asphalt, they might be using a lower reduction temperature or a higher reduction temperature, so they're going to 50 or 70. Uh, for us, again, the 30 is conservative, but we found that uh, it's not really affecting much the performance. Uh, increasing the foaming water content up to 2.6 of the weight of the asphalt binder during production of foamed worm mix asphalt did not seem to have a negative effect on the running performance or moisture-induced uh, moisture sensitivity of foamed worm mix asphalt. Therefore, a higher foaming water content can be specified for the production of foamed worm mix asphalt in Ohio. Again, probably there is a need to check with contractors to make sure that uh, this is not going to result in other issues in the bag house in terms of aggregate uh, clumping or uh, uh, dust uh, uh, clumps. Uh, producing foamed worm mix asphalt using moist aggregates resulted in inadequate aggregate uh, coating, leading to concerns with regard to moisture uh, induced damage and long term durability. Therefore, it's critical to use fully dried aggregates in the production of foamed worm mix asphalt to ensure satisfactory mix uh, performance. So, really, this is one of the uh, most important issues in here. It's if the aggregate is fully dry and you produce your foam dry mix asphalt at 30 degrees Fahrenheit temperature reduction using 1.8, 2.2, or even 2.6, we notice that, again, the performance is going to be comparable to the hot mix asphalt. Uh, to some extent, this is really uh, what we noticed. Uh, by comparing the uh, compaction data, we notice that there is no need to compact the foam dry mix asphalt mixtures to a higher density level uh, that common, than commonly used uh, for hot mix asphalt. Uh, again, uh, some people were looking at, uh, were raising the question of if warm mix asphalt are more compactable, do we need to compact it to a higher density in the field? And in here, again, based on what we noticed in this study, we don't feel there is a need to do that. There is no need to basically compact the foamed warm mix asphalt to 0.5% uh, 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 air void greater than or less than the hot mix asphalt. Since the performance of the foamed worm mix asphalt was comparable to that of the hot mix asphalt, no modifications are needed to the current mix design process used by ORAT for foamed worm mix asphalt mixtures. And this recommendation really uh, ties into the recent NCHRP studies that suggested that basically you can use the same mix design process for hot mix asphalt and apply it to the hot mix asphalt. So you don't need to have a laboratory forming device in the lab of each contractor to basically do a mix design for the formed worm mix asphalt. We noticed that, again, uh, we, you can simply use that uh, for hot mix asphalt and use the same uh, asphalt binder content uh, and aggregate degradation for the formed worm mix uh, asphalt. Okay, at this time, we're going to open the presentation up to questions. For those of you watching online, please email those questions to research at dot.state.oh.us. Are there any questions here in the room? Hey, Allah, on your low temperature, 
additional work that you mm -hmm. talked about with the TSRST. Is all that data going to be in the re report? No. Okay. No, that was uh, really done uh, uh, in addition to what was uh, promised in the proposal. Uh, we did that really to uh, try to see what would be the – like we didn't feel that the indirect tensile strength test that was performed in here was sufficient to compare hot mix asphalt and foamed warm mix asphalt. So uh, we did some additional testing uh, that was not really included in the report for this one. But I'll be, again, more than glad to share any results with you, and we can share it with others with your permission, if you wish. Any internet connection? Questions? Sure. I'm having a hard time formulating the questions. Okay. I'm a little bit confounded by your finding that the warm mix uh, did not perform better against low temperature cracking. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just wondering what you think may be happening there. Every, everybody's expectation is, is that if you do not heat the binder as mm -hmm. much, you do not age it as much, mm -hmm. and you would have uh, better residual performance mm -hmm. for uh, low temperature cracking. Yeah. We were expecting the same thing. This is really when we formulated the proposal. We did not really put too much attention to the, wor to the low temperature. We felt that uh, once we perform the indirect tensile strength, we will probably see that the warm mix asphalt is much better than the hot mix asphalt, and that will probably be the end of it. But we didn't really see that. So that's why we uh, did the tensile uh, uh, TSRST testing to make sure that we're basically seeing the right thing. Now, uh, to uh, reiterate uh, my uh, our preliminary finding for the low temperature, Where for the short-term aged specimens, uh, there was a little bit of a difference and the uh, hot mix asphalt was better than the warm mix asphalt for the uh, short-term aged specimens. For the long-term aged specimens, they were similar. So with aging, that difference tends to uh, disappear to some extent. Uh, now, uh, the difference, we're looking at about more like 3 degrees centigrade uh, difference. Now, what could have caused this difference between the two asphalt mixtures for the short-term aging? Okay, because, again, long-term aging, they look very similar. For the short-term aging, there is a little bit of uh, a difference. What could have caused this difference? One of the things is that, again, we have some air bubbles in these uh, foamed worm mix asphalt. So that may uh, reduce your area, your effective area, uh, to some extent, uh, leading it to break at a l uh, warmer temperature than the hot mix asphalt. Uh, the... Binder type, again, was uh, uh, the most important element that we noticed in there, and the low temperature PG grade is the most important point that we noticed in there. We, uh, when we looked at the literature to see how does our results compare to what people have found, we have found some studies that suggested that you get better performance for warm mix asphalt other studies suggested that you get comparable performance for warm mix asphalt, hot mix asphalt, and others have suggested that similar, found similar results to what we found. Uh, we think it's a process dependent. So where each study, again, used different uh, warm mix asphalt additive. Uh, not, uh, most of the people who used the foaming, they were focusing on the uh, field produced, not the laboratory produced. This is why we decided to do our study to try to more like add that piece uh, to the uh, puzzle. Uh, but again, we were expecting that the temperature, since you're producing it at 30 degrees Fahrenheit lower, you're going to have better uh, low temperature performance. But what we notice is that that temperature difference, if you're using only 30 degrees Fahrenheit, it's not that significant enough to really cause that big of a difference. So now it goes back to the basics. What 
would be the effect of the aggregate size, what is the effect of the aggregate si uh, type, and what is the effect of the binder type. Okay, there is a, the, that, the effect, the difference between the hot mix asphalt and warm mix asphalt is really masked by uh, some of these other factors. It's really what type of aggregate you use, what type of binder you use, and the aggregate size. And from these three, the binder type is the most important one on low temperature performance. That's what we basically have observed. Because you're really applying tension. You're not applying compression. Uh, so with tension, usually the binder, the glue, is going to be the most uh, significant. Do we know what the binders used for your test were? It's 64 minus 28 and 70 minus 22, which is the same as these. Were they polymer modified to get those grades, or do we know? Uh, we believe that one of them, the PG70 minus 22, is polymer modified, and the 64 minus 28 is uh, an acid modified. Okay. Because, again, especially for polymer and acid modification, when you ask contractors, uh, they will uh, share some information, but they're not going to reveal much about it. Uh, but for the, uh, what we believe, again, uh, these are polymer modified and acid modified, and this is something that, again, we were told by the uh, contractors. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we're going to go ahead and dismiss this. We'd like to thank everybody for participating. We would like to uh, remind you that within a couple of weeks, a recording of this presentation along with the PDF PowerPoint and the final report will be available on the Ohio DOT Research website. If you have additional questions you come up with that you'd like to have Dr. Abbas address, you can email those to research at DOT dot state dot oh dot us and we will forward those to him for response thank you all for participating